Hello. Whoop. Sorry. Trying to get my, um, there we go. All right. So today we're going to have a bit of a, you know, more real conversation. Um, that's a bit more personal to me. Normally I talk to you guys and it's more about mom life and things along those lines. But, um, I've been seeing a lot of stuff hit in my news feed, a lot of stuff coming into my private messages and what have you about postpartum, about depression. Um, I've received quite a few messages about my post about suicide. And um, I wanted to take a few minutes and kind of share with you. I'm trying to taste my words before I spit them out, so bear with me. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes and kind of share with you kind of why I feel like I can speak to that issue and what it means for me personally. Um, before I do that though, um, in the description of this video is the phone number for the crisis um, phone line. So if you're feeling like you're going to hurt yourself, I'm going to encourage you to get off this live and go ahead and make a phone call. That could save your life. Um, also, if you don't feel comfortable talking to people, maybe you're nervous about speaking on the phone with someone. The information for the crisis text line is there. You're going to text HOME to 741741 and someone will help you um, via text message and kind of help you figure out your resources. So I didn't want to go any further before saying that because I'm not a psychiatrist. Psych See, good morning. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not trained to diagnose or treat anything. I'm more just sharing kind of my experiences and my walk with it. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of dig in and give you a little context and share a little bit of my story. So I was born to two parents who weren't really planning on kids. It, it wasn't really the story that they were planning to write at all. Um, my mom came from a very, very airplane. My mom came from a very, very broken home. My grandmother was very abusive. My grandmother was not mentally stable. And, you know, that left an impact on my mom. And then my dad, he was young and he has a temper and he has some issues of his own. And so I was born into kind of that brokenness even to start with. And as I got older, I witnessed a lot of things that I wish I never would have seen that I would never want my kids to see. I've I watched abuse, you know, I watched my dad abuse my stepmoms. I watched, you know, countless occasions of drug use. I've watched, um, you know, just all kinds of things. I, um, there was just a lot that I was subjected to at a very young age. And, you know, by the age of five, I had already been molested. By the age of 10 or 11, I had already started using drugs. Um, and alcohol, you know, by 14, I was in a really unhealthy place. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know anything about hope. I was just very broken. I had hopped from parent to parent. And, you know, by that point, I was thinking about dropping out of school. I was just not in a good place. And, you know, I met what I thought was Prince Charming at 14. And, you know, because at 14, we meet Prince Charming, right? Um, and, you know, he made me feel good about myself. He told me everything that I needed to hear and made me feel valid and made me feel important. And then my mom decided that we were going to move across the country to Alaska and I was going to leave Mr. Perfect behind and I was going to be alone again and I was going to be unloved again. And that was too much for me to bear. And, um, when I was, let's see. I had turned 15 by this point, and my mom had sent me over to Washington State to stay with my grandmother, and I had already had a few suicide attempts under my belt by this point, Just be, but at that point, it was more about attention. It was more about um, the guy that I had a thing for lived in a program that was right next to a residential facility. And I thought that if I made certain choices, I could be put into the facility right near him and not have to leave. So that's where I was initially. So I made, you know, minor suicide attempts, enough to get attention, enough for a Baker Act, enough for those things. But I didn't really understand what I was doing with my future. You know, I just assumed, you know, hey, I'm taking this into my own control. And every time I was Baker Acted, it was terrifying. It was so horrible because, you know, it wasn't 
this, you know, a lot of people think it's like an escape so that you can get your mind right. And for me, it was just a really overwhelming thing as a teenager because I, you know, I was messing around and I wasn't really ready for help. I really didn't understand at that point that I needed help. Um, when I moved over to Washington and was staying there, my mom was driving across the country and she had warned my grandmother that she needed to keep an eye on me and keep medications put up. And my grandmother trusted me because I convinced her she could. And within, you know, a week of being there, you know, I was back to dosing my own medications. I was back to taking care of myself. And um, I'll never forget the day because all contact was ceased with the guy that I had a thing for. There was a lot of back issues I'm not going to discuss here. But, um, and I was very lonely and I had asked my uncle, I know it's going to sound silly, but I had asked my uncle if he would let me smoke pot with him because I knew that he was out there smoking pot. I wanted to smoke pot. I just wanted to escape for a little while. And he told me no, because he didn't want my grandma mad. And that was kind of a trigger for me. And I didn't write a letter. I didn't say goodbye. There was no, there was no warning. There was no, you know, oh, I should have known. Oh, you know, I didn't get all mopey. I didn't apologize. I didn't you know, give things away. There were none of those symbols and those signs that everybody tells you to watch for. I just decided I was done. And um, I won't go into detail with how I attempted. I will say that I overdosed, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and I closed the door, and I was ready to go. I was ready to say goodbye to my life, and I was ready to move on. And, you know, I got... Love you, Jen. Um just saw her in the live um you know i was ready to be done and i went upstairs because i got scared i got scared because i didn't expect things to hurt and it hurt and i went to apologize to my grandmother and i said i'm sorry grandma i made a what i was trying to say was mistake but then i became ill and um you know i was talking about kind of the context of the parents i had the grandparents what have you um my grandma didn't call an ambulance. There was no reach out for help on that level. Um, instead, <laughs> she called my dad and she said, your, your daughter's made a big mistake. You need to get over here and clean this mess up. Um, and my dad came over. He made me throw up and he sent me downstairs to go to sleep because he figured you throw up a few times, you're fine. An overdose is over. You'll be just fine. And I was actually sent downstairs to sleep it off. And, um, I don't know how long I was down there. I know that the, the uncle that refused to do drugs with me, that uncle fought for my life essentially and told him, you know, no, we need to get her in. We need to get her help. And at some point I was pulled from the bed and taken to the hospital. Um, I don't remember much of that night. I do know that I coded. I know that I almost died because of the amount of stuff in my system and because of, the fact that I had been left for a long time. Um, and, you know, my mom was called and I was surprisingly not admitted to that hospital, to a psych facility, anything. I was put on a plane to my mom. And I spent, you know, a few weeks with my mom kind of trying to convince her that, hey, I need help. I can't do this. This is, you know, this isn't over. And I wish that she would have known. I wish that she would have seen that, you know, I did need that help, but, you know, we weren't there. She was just trying to settle. She was trying to move on with life. She was trying to build something new for me when I was still trapped in what was. And um, so I walked up to a police officer when we were out at an event with my mom, and I told him, I said, listen, I said, if you don't get me help, I will end my life today. So you have a choice to make here. And the officer's like, are you messing with me? I said, well, you are talking to me after four attempts and my last one almost succeeded. So it's your choice as to what you do with this. Um, I was put into a police cruiser. I was taken to the psych facility there in Alaska. Um, my mom had no idea where I was. Nobody notified her. I couldn't remember what hotel we were living at at that point so i couldn't even really make her aware of where we were and you know of where i was it took us i was in that psych facility for four days 
before I was able to notify my mom of where I was. And, you know, from there I did three months in the psych facility and I did another year in a residential treatment facility. Um, I turned 16 in a psych facility. I didn't do any of my high school life. I had dropped out. You know, there were a lot of things I missed out on because of that season of my life, but I got the help that I needed. Um, and looking back, like a lot of people ask me, they're like, you know, how can someone consider suicide? How can someone go there? You know, how can they let themselves be so selfish? And the one thing I wish I could say to you is it's not from a selfish place. For me, it wasn't, you know, I am going to take away your control. I am going to do any of these things that a lot of people assume. Instead, for me, it was I genuinely believed that this world would be better without me in it. I genuinely believed that I was doing someone a kindness. And that's not the case. If you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with these thoughts, you need to understand that you matter. The world is not better without you. You are needed. And the other thing that I struggled with was that I thought that it wouldn't get better. I thought that that life that I was living with, you know, neglect and the lack of love and drugs and just all these different things, like, I thought that was it. And I thought that was the stopping point. And... I wish that me now, I wish I could go back and talk to me at 14, 15 and say, hey, it gets so much better than this. There is so much on the other side of this that you just can't see. Um, you know, because, and if I cry, I apologize. It's just, it's very real for me as I've had some friends walk in some hard stuff lately and we've had these conversations, but I look at everything that I would have missed. I would have missed my husband. I would have missed my children. I would have missed my home. I would have missed feeling loved, feeling taken care of, feeling what it is to finally be completely seen and cared for by someone. Um, all those things never would have happened if I would have stopped it. Um, a good friend of mine says that suicide's putting a period where there needs to be a comma. And, you know, I agree with that 100%. Um, when you're in the middle of a horrible storm, when you're in the middle of the darkest season of your life, it's really easy to assume that that's where it stops and that it'll never get better, you know, that it's always going to hurt um, and that it's just, it's always going to be that pain. And I have to tell you, that's not where it stops. That's not where your story ends. Now, is it going to take work? Yes. Is it going to take owning your truth? Yes. Are you going to have to be willing to say, I'm not okay right now and this is not okay? You will. You're going to have to own that and you're going to have to own the fact that you're not in a good headspace. And it's going to mean dropping the super mom or the super person mentality because, you know, people put such a stigma on mental health issues now. And so admitting that you struggle, it's difficult because people have such strong opinions about it. But I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what they think at the end of the day. It really doesn't. What matters at the end of the day is you need to be able to live with you and you need to be able to take care of you. And if that means that, you know, judgy people are going to be judgy, well, guess what? You just figured out who you need to unfriend and who you need to move away from. Because you need to be surrounded by healthy people who are going to bring you strength and bring you health and not people who are going to bring you down. Um, and I feel like I'm going to go ahead and go on a little mini tangent here just because I think it needs said. Moms, dads, listen to your kids. If they're telling you I need help, if they're lashing out, reach out for that help. That said, lawmakers, those people in charge make help accessible please for the love of everything do you know how hard it is to get your children the help they need we talk about shootings we talk about all these you know suicides and all the bullying and all the violence where is the easily accessible help so that these children can deal with these issues you guys need to get on this we need to make it more accessible and we need to make it safe for kids to talk about it because the fact of the matter is Nobody's going to get help if they don't have a resource for it and if they don't have an easy access point to get to that. 
I have a friend who's going through some mental health issues and she's looking at June before she sees an emergency appointment. I'm not even talking about an appointment, you know, for a general appointment because she's feeling a little under the weather. That's not okay. That's not okay. Um, and if you're stuck in that side of the coin where help is hard to find and you want to get better, I'm going to challenge you to push harder, scream louder, fight for you. Fight for you because nobody else will at times. And that's okay. It's okay to own that. And it's okay to say, you know what? The people in my circle right now aren't fighting for me, but I'm going to fight for me because I matter. Um, because you do matter and you're worth fighting for. And, you know, I can't say this enough. Like, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you're walking, what your road is. If you're, you know, dealing with postpartum, if everything's gone to crap because you've made some choices that you're going to have to live with, whatever the case may be, you still matter and fight for you. Um, because I'll tell you what's on the other side is beautiful and what's on the other side of that matters. And you're never going to see the good part of the story if you end the story. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I'm at. And I feel like I'm going to wrap it up there. But I don't want to end the conversation just by posting a video and being done. So here's what I'm going to say. Either in the comments of this video, let's continue the conversation. Or over in the Megan Gets Real, uh, Real Talk for Real Moms Facebook group, which I'll tag in the comments. Go ahead and come join the conversation over there because I feel like this needs to be discussed and I feel like a video is not going to end the conversation, but at least we can start the conversation and we can get things moving from here. Um, other than that, I hope you have an awesome day and I hope you fight for your future because you deserve to have a tomorrow.